it's interesting Ealing used to be a walled town and uh, if you start from the, the south coming up from Queen's Ferry uh, there's an area there called the Poplars which is always puzzling to be poplars are big long trees but apparently in 1778 the town council had put poplar trees outside the town walls now these would be by old crofts uh, which we know from the roods there would be addison's yard well these are 19th century names addison's yards and binning's yard and uh, before that the sick man's acre and a place called uh, Algiers wind or daggers wind which was used to go down to a little well at the bay, but uh, then got blocked off, you may say, by the paper mill. But it was used by mill workers to go down through the allotments and along the back of the mill and into the front uh, gate. Coming up to what was the town wall, um, the first thing you would notice was that there were tenements in Inverkeeling. That's something you wouldn't expect in a small borough town. You wouldn't get that in Kouras. Remember I told you about the Glasgow spill coming in 62? Well, they weren't the first. In 1912, when the uh, dockyard was built, lots of people came uh, to build the dockyard and develop the, the uh, docks and grave out the docks and so on, and they had to be housed. So this big tenement uh, was put in with four storeys and two shops at the bottom. And then further up there was another tenement and then you came to what would be the, the old town wall. On the left was the Corn Exchange. The Corn Exchange was built about the eighteen mid-1800s, I'm not quite sure. And then there's a little uh, wind going down to the, the mill and that was just outside the old town wall. Within the wall there was a place uh, called Ferguson House, which was a house with the four stairs, which I'd seen in 62 and photographed before it was demolished. And behind that, there was a long row of houses and a courtyard in behind. That's now in Grieg Court, uh, which goes on to Roman Road. Roman Road to the west was the way round the town if the gates were closed. And Roman Road became our road, which went past our farmhouse and later became Rood's Road. And so you could go round the town and bypass it if you had animals, you know, uh, rather than uh, through the town. Beyond uh, Ferguson's house, there was a house going back to about the 1780s, and then some modern 19th century sandstone tenements with shops in them, uh, hunters, grocers, another small shop. And then newer buildings. There was a post office building which was a flat roofed building and then there was a cafe which was uh, Mr Taddy's. Uh, it had a jukebox which was unusual and you know quite ambitious for the 60s and it had our only neon sign outside in two colours argon and neon. Oh three colours argon, neon and xenon I think. It was uh, you may laugh, but that was going something for a small town. And it had a beautiful uh, cafe at the back with a terrazzo floor and uh, skylight windows and this jukebox, which was a great uh, draw. Then there was a, a, a fruit shop and then the Volunteers Arms, which was a pub on the corner of Hill Street. Hill Street, or Dunfermline Wind, went west up the hill and across Roman Road and lo and behold another set of tenements, Queen Mary Terrace, uh, red sandstone, built about 1902 or 3 or 10, I don't know, somewhere around there, and another set of uh, two-storey, three-storey buildings opposite. Really quite unusual. Going up uh, Rood Road, or Roman Road, the police station had been built in 1903 and then on the right was our farmhouse and before us there were one or two weavers cottages but that was all that was on the outer part of the town. Continuing along the high street there was a big grocer's and then there was a, a chemist and a baby uh, woolen shop, baby 
grow shop in a 19th century building built in uh, Whinstone. Then there was a National Commercial Bank and then another shop and then the Clydesdale Bank which was built on the site of the Gala Tower. Another two-storey building with shops below and um, flats above. One was Garchor's, the uh, haberdashers and uh, general clothing store. Um, can't remember the next one. And uh, after that, uh, there was a, 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 a little uh, pub and further along, the Queen's Hotel. And the Queen's Hotel actually had stables uh, because that was a, an important thing in the early part of the 20th century. Beyond the Queen's Hotel, there was a Scots Building, which is a very ancient building of the forest there, and locals called it the Ark. It was really so old-fashioned. It was demolished in about 1903, uh, in order, it's 1910, in order to make um, a, a new entry into the school, stairways and uh, a little garden leading up to the school. And beyond that was Fordell's Lodging, which was a turreted townhouse of three storeys that belonged to the Fordell family uh, up at uh, up the North Road. Beyond that, there was a row of uh, small white vernacular houses. The thing I remember most about that was Mrs Cunningham had her sweet shop there and I remember that we had to give uh, coupons over the counter until about 1953 in order to get sweets and uh, one day mum said to me there's no more rationing in for sweets so you can uh, go and choose what you like. Uh, that's why I remember that. Going back to Taddy's Cafe, as you went in there was uh, ice cream uh, on one side and uh, the coffee and cakes. The ice cream was a Shrapney cone and I think if you maybe paid a little extra or maybe you didn't, you got a little dip of uh, raspberry sauce. But it was very, very seldom that we really stopped for ice cream. The habit of sort of eating ice cream every day when you were out just hadn't taken on. And it wasn't until about 1963 that the grocers opposite uh, the Volunteer Arms became what we call a mini market with a kind of serve yourself uh, set out. Loaves were 11 pence halfpenny, which was quite a lot of money in those days. After um, Mrs Cunningham's shop and a few uh, little cottages, there was the Baptist Church, and then a lane which went up two steps and a lane which went up the north side of the school. So children use that quite a lot. And the next rood, I think, was called the Belto Rood. It was actually a field, there were two or three fields, and it belonged to a little farm called Rood Bank, which was set back from the road, and that was a market garden. Probably about 18... 90s, I think, or earlier, judging by the sandstone house, but there were older buildings which are made of whinstone. You see, I'm using my knowledge of when quarries were opened and closed to <laughs> very roughly date these. That was arable land until 1963, and then it was taken over by the town, and uh, Rood's Crescent was built in there. The Belto Rood was a Rood which was owned by the church. And we rented that, and the money which we paid included a teend or tenth, which uh, went to the church's coffers to pay for a new uh, piece of tow or rope on the, on the bell. But really it was a way of financing a church. And we also paid teens to uh, George Street in Edinburgh, to the Church of Scotland, for some of the land that we, we rented. Now these teens were round about one and threepence, which I think is sixpence in modern money, and these were paid to 121 George Street. That was some money back in the 1800s, but even in the um, 1960s, you were spending the equivalent of about 
a penny halfpenny in modern money to, to send uh, sixpence, you know, to send a postal order or something like that. Uh, so in 72, the government decreed that teens could be redeemed. I think you paid eight times or ten times the face value if you're teened, and after that it was written off. And a good thing too, uh, because there's an awful lot of paperwork when you owned land and had all these things to, to fill in. Uh, beyond the uh, the um, Root Square, there was um, Allen Bank, which was a private house, and then St John's Church, which was a free church, United Free Church, that had moved away from the uh, Church of Scotland in the 19th century or the, the late 18th century. It had a beautiful stone stairway and it had metal um, railings and a metal arch with a, a central lamp, Victorian sort of style. After that there was a doctor's house, which was a villa, which had its own uh, consulting room and waiting room built onto the side. And the Labour Party Hall was set in a little uh, enclave, a little uh, lay-by there. It was a wooden hut uh, in those days, but very well kept. And then after that you went up uh, a road to Chapel Place, which used to be called the, the Loaning. By the end of Chapel Place you had reached the road going along to uh, Rosyth, and which now went on to Hillend, so that was the, the north of the town. And beyond that lay the Kirkgate Park on the Great North Road, and further up there was a horse trough on the right-hand side for horses and wagons that um, used that road going north. Coming back into town, on the left you would see a field which was above the uh, railway station. That was called Croft and Ree, the King's Croft. And there was also, I think, a, a manse for the St John's Church, I'm not sure, a big sandstone house opposite there. Then there was Borland Road, which went uh, down and round to Hill End, across the railway. Then there was the entrance to the cinema. Uh, there was a big sort of canopy and people sheltered under that. There was, on, there was some stairs under and then a an asphalt path going down and believe it or not there was this almost open air shelter it had walls for about a metre and a half and then pillars and a kind of tin roof and one 60 watt bulb and people queued there waiting on the cinema opening because the cinema might have opened at 6 on a Saturday night and then there was another show at uh, say 7.30 or quarter to 8 so people queued there quite happily uh, sometimes in the rain the thing is that there's a certain animal warmth there, but um, there's also smoke. People smoked all the time, and it was really quite astonishing when you think back how, the, how smoky the cinema was, how smoky restaurants were, and so on. That's something that you would really notice if you went back in a time machine. Beyond the cinema, which is a very nice building with a sort of Art Deco frontage, two square towers and two uh, domes on top of the towers, there was a big old building which was called the Modal Lodging House and this was one of these lodging houses that had been there for navvies who were graving out the dockyards. Now it was used as a factory and it made I think plastic raincoats and it took on the name Modo. Uh, further along there was another tenement uh, with shops that had the co-op dairy but before that there were two temporary buildings just uh, wooden huts really with tin roofs and that's where James Murray had um, his fish shop and the fish shop had uh, slabs in the window for the fish and across the middle of the window there was a pipe and on very hot days it turned on the water and water dribbled down the window to keep the display cool. Refrigeration was really not known except along at the butcher shop where they had a walk-in refrigerator about maybe six or eight metres square, uh, but that was the only refrigerator really in town. Um, after the Mr Murray's fish shop, his brother had a stationery and, and newspaper shop, it, also in a, a temporary tin hut. When I look at it, 
I think that area was designated for another tenement, like the one that was further along, but um, it never got built, probably because the cinema was doing too well and wouldn't sell out. Um, beyond the, uh, the second tenement, rather to your surprise, there was a very steep road going down the, down the brae, down to the Keething Burn. And it had uh, Dunlop Terrace, which was four bays of tenements built down the road, you know, facing north-south. Really beautiful buildings, but very, very steep road. You wouldn't really want to, well, nobody had a car, but if you, if you had a car, you wouldn't want to take the car down the road or up the road in, on an icy day. But it shows the pressure there was to build, um, uh, you know, for people in the 1910s in the town. Round the corner, at the top of the tenement, there was a small uh, workshop and garage, and then Heriot Street, which had uh, what was meant to be the, the house that belonged to a relative of, uh, of Dr Livingston. Um, there's lots of myths and tales told about that, but uh, it wasn't Dr Livingston's house. There is some connection, though. Coming along the main street, there was a grammar school, which is a sandstone building with a dome. Um, and then next to that, the church, 14th century tower, rebuilt about 1825 with a perpendicular styled windows, uh, nicely designed inside. Only a balcony at the back, uh, there, were, there was loft room, you know, to put a balcony all the way around, but it was never really needed. The church had some of the earliest stained glass windows from, uh, I think, Germany, the big... East window it was a bit of a novelty at the time it was put in, in the 1820s. And other stained glass windows have been added since, including the most recent one, which commemorates the paper mill and Mr Johnson, who came in 1938 and was there till about 1980s as minister. He was there all my time, which is quite a, a, a record. Beyond the church, there was Holborn House, which is a fairly nondescript looking tenement but I think it has quite a history and another small house and then on the corner um, a building which we knew as the Cadora Cafe. There were lots of cafes and fish and chip shops in the towns. There was Taddy's, the Cadora and in Town Hall Street there was uh, De Vito's um, fish and chip shop which I think had coal fired fish fryers and I believe in the 30s uh, they had uh, a phonograph with a big horn, uh, you know, playing Italian records in the corner because the owner was Italian and liked to hear the great Caruso sing as he battered the fish. Um, there is a legend that somebody put a poke of peas down the horn and muffled it. And the owner said, well, put the peas down the camophone horn and stop at the singing of the great Caruso. But that may just be a myth. Um, further along, there was a nice uh, building which was uh, a stationer's called Phoenix, and it had an almost English looking bay window, uh, just obviously an old house which had been done up nicely. Facing the square, looking south, there was a big uh, emporium, Kenway's uh, tea, wines, and uh, fancy goods kind of uh, grocers. And just at the side of that building, there was a great metal trunk uh, going up, obviously carrying cables, because this was the telephone exchange for the town. And it was built probably about 1900s, upstairs. The paper mill was in Brookhaven 1, uh, our farm was 114, and uh, the chemist was 26. So obviously these are early adopters of the telephone. That telephone exchange uh, continued till about 1962. But in 1942, in the middle of the war, uh, people were getting anxious about bombing because uh, we were in a fair target area with the fourth bridge and the dockyard. And um, the telephone the engineers put in a new cable uh, along Rood Road, where we lived, and built a concrete blockhouse diagonally opposite us, which was a new uh, 
telephone exchange that carried all the dockyard lines. And in the event of the High Street being bombed, they would have just switched over to these lines. So the whole set of lines was installed in the conduits under the, the road, and which was then laid uh, properly as a road with, uh, you know, pavements. And uh, after the war, uh, in 63, that became the new automatic telephone exchange because all the cables were already there, so it was easy to switch, switch that back. Coming down the high street from the north, uh, on the east side, the seaside, Providence House, I think 1688, God's Providence is my inheritance. Then there was Aitchison House, which was burned down in a big fire. So a stone from that is now put up on the facade of an extension to the Borough Arms. And it's got a 16-something date and 1888 written above. Then there's the Borough Arms Hotel. The fire obviously had cleared quite a bit of that because there's a sandstone building with a kind of Venetian um, balcony projecting out with a, a bay window, which was Mrs. Mercer's fruit shop. There was uh, a small grocer's called Dick's Cooperative Society. That was an independent cooperative, and not to be confused with the cooperative dairy, which was further along at Dunlop Terrace, because that was a sort of national Scottish cooperative. The little uh, sandstone building uh, actually made quite a good backdrop on the square for the crowning of the Gala Queen because every year a, a girl was chosen as a Gala Queen and the stage was set up there and there are lots of pictures on the Friday uh, of the Gala Queens being crowned and the coronation. Beyond uh, that there was the Royal Hotel. The Royal Hotel was renovating itself in uh, 1962 and they dug up the floor and they discovered that there was, there was a well underneath. It had been a courtyard and uh, then they built forward obviously in the 1800s. So they reinstated the well and uh, left it in the floor as a wishing well when they renovated the building. Beyond that there were several sort of ordinary kind of shops. There was also a small um, shop for the Dunfermline Cooperative Funeral Service. It had a sign <coughs> with its name and number <coughs> and that someone was in attendance if, or could come down and interview people if they had a funeral to arrange. That was something that was done on the high street. You didn't need to go all the way to Dunfermline. And then beyond that was uh, the, 18, the 1688 building that my uncle had as a store with the small windows. And after that you went on to Queen Street which had various buildings and then the Friary which is an ancient building with a big stone stair and massive vaults. Facing up the square north there was a, a building which was my uncle's ironmonger's shop, the hardware store, and uh, it had been renovated in the 1880s. It has a flat upstairs and a shop downstairs. Today it's locksmiths. I worked in that shop uh, went from the time I was 16 till about 22 or so in the, the summer and uh, in the winter. So I got to know lots of people uh, you know, who came in as customers. One couple came in quite a lot in 62, 63 and they, I knew, had bought an old dilapidated building in uh, Town Hall Street called Thompson's House. And they were doing it up, and they were going to do it up as a proper uh, renovation like the ones in Kouris. Now Thompson's house had a, a close, you could go in and through and end up in a, a croft in the back, uh, and there was a ducat further down, and uh, that was a little farm in itself. You could have driven cattle through that close. And then in through the door there was a stone stairway and a mullioned stone window, uh, which must go back a long way. And up at the top of that stairway, uh, on the third storey, there was a little cap house like you get in uh, Kouris. There was a two-storey building and then a little turret house at the top. Inside, about maybe three metres in, there were arcades. So obviously this building had been set back from the road, just like the uh, Royal Hotel had been, and then had built out later. 
There were two stones on that house, uh, except the Lord bless the house, they labour in vain that build it. And another one, care not, care bought in ordinarily, which is up on the lintel on the, the first floor. Now, Mr and Mrs Finlay, who did up that building, were very, very uh, enthusiastic about getting it restored properly and getting it uh, put right. And they came in and uh, <coughs> were talking to me about it, and I expressed an interest. And they were um, good enough to invite me and, and lots of others to a, a Hogmanay party one uh, year, once they were in a kind of housewarming. <coughs> and they, they had electric light, of course, and uh, so on. But they also had a log fire. And I remember sort of, yes, late at night, there were one or two lamps on, but uh, one or two candles. And there was a fiddler uh, sitting in the corner playing music, just lazily. And uh, a few couples just dancing, but, you know, just lazily. They were much more mellow because they were getting into New Year. And I looked round at the flickering firelight and the fiddler, and apart from the fact they were dressed in 60s clothes, it could have been uh, the, the 1760s. It was really, really nice to be there in, in that setting. And that was a house that had always had my interest. The, the close was open and anyone could wander in and the back uh, garden was derelict. And I'd photographed that too. And it was so nice to see it being renovated. But if only other houses in the town had been done at that time, one down King Street, 17th century, uh, Ferguson's house with the four stairs, it would have been wonderful, but... Alas, it was not to be. Going down Hope Street from the High Street, there was a small um, modern inset building, which was a, a stationer's. Then there was Niven's uh, butcher's shop. It was a big whinstone building with ashlar sandstone on the corners, and it had the walk-in refrigerator inside. It was a properly set out butcher's shop with steel uh, yard arms here to hold meat, and it had tiles uh, set in on the side of the windows and the shop windows and uh, tiled walls and sawdust on the floor. Uh, a typical butcher shop. And, of course, carcasses hanging open to the air and any uh, passing blue bottles. <coughs> I don't think they had any of these uh, ultraviolet lights that killed blue bottles in those days. It really makes you think. The other uh, famous uh, thing in that department was Aggie Moody's shop. She had a nice uh, sweet shop with a nice display uh, and all the um, hundreds and thousands of bonbons, you know, in a, a big uh, tray in the window. But very often her ginger Tom was ensconced there enjoying the sunshine. Could I just ask, um, is Thompson's house, Thompson's house? Thompson's house, yes. Is it still there? Yes, of course. Oh, very good. And, uh, oh, next to it there was the... Uh, the um, music hall. The music hall was a sort of institution. It had been a kind of public hall and it had been a British restaurant during the war. It was a dilapidated old place. Everything was dilapidated in the 50s. And uh, I did have some aesthetic sense. And I sort of used to say to my parents, why can this place not be painted? Um, or why has our house got such old-fashioned brass switches. I'm sure I'm getting a shock off this brass switch. And they said, oh, no, no, it's the war, you see. We haven't had time, we haven't had money to do anything like that. And uh, luckily one day, Dad got a shock off the brass switch on a, a very wet day, and the electrician was called. And when I came back from school, the first thing I noticed was there was a white plastic switch just at the bottom of the stairs. And I dropped my school bag and I raced up to the top, switched on the light, raced up to the top, and lo, there was a white plastic switch at the top of the stairs. And I realised, never again will I have this tingling shock uh, when I'm going up and down the stairs. And, well, it was the same uh, in the music hall. It was painted cream, and green, of course, it might be, and the stage was kind of rickety, and there were two kind of old... Uh, metal shades uh, as, as uh, stage lights with 200 watt screw-in bulbs. You know, that was state of the art in those days. And when it was full of people, uh, the walls kind of ran with condensation because there was no forced ventilation 
or air conditioning or anything like that. But that's just what it was like. Uh, and St John's Hall uh, was like that too. But what I remember from the music hall was going into a pantomime or a, a, a Christmas show for children. And it was very good. It was very crowded and very stuffy. And actually, although it was good and uh, I was really glad to get away from it. And um, so the music hall got demolished about 1963 or four, and uh, Thompson's house built a little garage and an extension in stone frontage. And that was good because next to it was the old bank house, also in Town Hall Street, just next to Providence House. And the bank house was made of uh, yellow sandstone. It had a big arched doorway and a double wooden door with a postern gate in it. So normally visiting a house just opened the postern gate, but you could open the two double doors and drive in and there were garages and a courtyard there. I believe there were quite good vaults underneath the building as well, but I never saw them, but I knew that they existed. Um, that was one of the early banks in the, in the town. And then there was Providence House. St John's Hall was next to St John's Church on the other end of town. It also uh, was ambitious but sort of simple. It had a hall keeper's house upstairs. Downstairs it had uh, just a big room and a stage and I don't even know if there's a dressing room, maybe there's just a bit of space beside the stage behind a curtain. But there were some great shows put on there. Uh, the BBs put on a good show and the Youth Fellowship there put on a good show and uh, their concerts were the highlight uh, of the year through the 60s. That was something that, uh, again, we just took for granted. We never thought about it. Normally we would go to the cinema locally, the Majestic, or we'd take the bus up to uh, Dunfermline where there was a Regal and uh, another um, cinema uh, for, for the bigger shows like uh, South Pacific and uh, um, yeah, the, the bigger uh, shows that came out at that time. The coming of stereo sound was uh, really quite an eye-opener in the 60s because we'd never heard anything like that. And uh, loudspeakers at the side of the uh, cinema so that when this plane came in over, well, we heard it before we saw it, and then the plane came in over our heads onto the screen flying into this Pacific, <laughs> Pacific Island. It was really quite incredible. Uh, it's very difficult to explain how exciting things were, like stereo sound, record players that you could carry, and portable radios. Uh, after one particularly good harvest, uh, Dad bought a small portable radio with microvalves, and uh, it used 67 and a half volt batteries, that was rather special, it was usually 90 volt and one and a half. But these microvalves, you see, didn't need so much voltage. Valves always needed voltage. And um, it worked off the mains in the living room, but believe it or not, you could lift it up and put it in the car and take it away on picnics. And you may laugh, it kind of weighed about five kilos, but that was going some for, um, for that age. And uh, also it was done in a nice leatherette, as was Gordon's uh, dance set record player. Colour was coming in. You had the distinct impression in the 60s that everything happened in black and white because you saw black and white movies and pictures of the war in black and white. And then suddenly, in around about 62, 63, colour came. And lo and behold, the bank manager, who was a friend of ours, goes across the wall, uh, invited us down to see the first colour television, which I think was showing Sir Winston Churchill's funeral. That was the first time I saw colour TV. We didn't have a television until 66, as I said, and then we got a decent one in uh, 70. But that was when Dad was more or less retiring. Uh, so that just shows how unimportant <laughs> television was in, in our life. Now, going back to the Hope Street uh, afternoons, there was Adam Box, who was the other ironmongers, and he had a really good display of um, fancy goods. If you wanted to buy casseroles, or if you wanted to buy uh, a stool, or um, something, a uh, step ladder, or something like that, he had these bigger pieces of ironmongery. And then after that was a doctor's surgery. 
In Queen Street at the back, in 63 or 62, the new Civic Centre was built. And that was a great step forward because it had a really decent hall with a good stage and a few dressing rooms and things so proper concerts could be held. And the church hired that to have um, their annual sale of work. And in those days, sales of work were opened, not just by the minister, but by a little committee of dignitaries um, that sat up on the stage. Things were very much more formal, if you know what, what I mean. And uh, these formalities were all terribly important. But that's just the way it was. But the, the sale of work always was a great event and, and did very well. After the, um, the Civic Centre, there was another building which actually I think was a bookies, and then you came to the ridge which marked where the town hall was, and then down to the Corn Exchange, and then a few tenements called the Poplars, and then uh, the little allotments and Anger's Wine going down to the mill. There were a few villas out of town, but further down was Rich Now. Now that was a small community, again tenements, and uh, well-built tenements, about 1910, 1912, and one or two shops there too. Mainly more specialist shops. Uh, somebody who sold Maxim light bulbs had a shop for a while. He, they used it as a depot. Uh, a man who did shoe repairs had a, a, a workshop down there. A, he had the space, and B, there was room to park, which there wouldn't have been in the high street where it used to be, you see. So you went down there with your, your shoes and left them and got them repaired. And that was Mr Prentice. He uh, stopped work, I think, about 1980s. So that's sort of a quick walk around the town. Um, it was good to be able to know these people who have renovated.